As to the justice of God requiring the punishment of the sinner, I have said enough. That the mere suffering of the sinner can be no satisfaction to justice, I have also tried to show. If the suffering of the sinner be indeed required by the justice of God, let it be administered. But what shall we say adequate to confront the base representation that it is not punishment, not the suffering of the sinner that is required, but suffering? Nay, as if this were not depth enough of baseness to crown all heathenish representation of the ways of God, that the suffering of the innocent is unspeakably preferable in his eyes to that of the wicked, as a make-up for wrong done. Nay, again, in the lowest deep, a lower deep, that the suffering of the holy, the suffering of the loving, the suffering of the eternally and perfectly good is supremely satisfactory to the pure justice of the Father of spirits. Not all the suffering that could be heaped upon the wicked could buy them a moment's respite, so little is their suffering a counterpoise to their wrong. In the working of this law of equivalence, this lex talionis, the suffering of millions of years could not equal the sin of a moment, could not pay off one farthing of the deep debt. But so much more valuable, precious, and dear is the suffering of the innocent, so much more of a satisfaction, observe, to the justice of God, that in return for that suffering another wrong is done. The sinners who deserve and ought to be punished are set free. I know the root of all that can be said on the subject. The notion is embedded in the grey matter of my Scotch brains, and if I reject it, I know what I reject. For the love of God, my heart rose early against the low invention. Strange that in a Christian land it should need to be said that to punish the innocent and let the guilty go free is unjust. It wrongs the innocent, the guilty, and God himself it would be the worst of all wrongs to the guilty to treat them as innocent the whole device is a piece of spiritual charlatanry fit only for a fraudulent jail delivery if the wicked ought to be punished it were the worst possible perversion of justice to take a righteous being however strong and punish him instead of the sinner however weak to the poorest idea of justice and punishment, it is essential that the sinner, and no other than the sinner, should receive the punishment. The strong being that was willing to bear such punishment might well be regarded as worshipful. But what of the God whose so-called justice he thus defeats? If you say it is justice, not God, that demands the suffering, I say justice cannot demand that which is unjust, and the whole thing is unjust. God is absolutely just, and there is no deliverance from his justice which is one with his mercy. The peace is an absurdity, a grotesquely deformed absurdity. To represent the living God as a party to such a style of action is to veil with a mask of cruelty and hypocrisy the face whose glory can be seen only in the face of Jesus. To put a tirade of vulgar Roman legality into the mouth of the Lord God merciful and gracious who will by no means clear the guilty. Rather than believe such ugly folly of him whose very name is enough to make those that know him heave the breath of the heart panting for the water brooks, rather than think of him what in a man would make me avoid him at the risk of my life, I would say, There is no God. Let us neither eat nor drink that we may die. For lo, this is not our God, this is not he for whom we have waited. But I have seen his face and heard his voice in the face and the voice of Jesus Christ. And I say, this is our God. The very one whose being the creator makes it an infinite gladness to be the created. I will not have the God of the scribes and the Pharisees, whether Jewish or Christian, Protestant, Roman, or Greek, but thy Father, O Christ, he is my God. If you say, That is our God, not yours, I answer, Your portrait of your God is an evil caricature of the face of Christ. To believe in a vicarious sacrifice is to think to take refuge with the Son from the righteousness of the Father, to take refuge with his work instead of with the Son himself, to take refuge with the theory of that work instead of the work itself, 
to shelter behind a false quirk of law instead of nestling in the eternal heart of the unchangeable and righteous Father, who is merciful and that he renders to every man according to his work and compels their obedience, nor admits judicial quibble or subterfuge. God will never let a man off with any fault. He must have him clean. He will excuse him to the very uttermost of truth, but not a hair's breadth beyond it. He is his true father, and will have his child true as his son Jesus Christ is true. He will impute to him nothing that he has not, will lose sight of no smallest good that he has, will quench no smoking flax, break no bruised reed, but send forth judgment unto victory. He is God beyond all that heart hungriest for love and righteousness could to eternity desire. If you say the best of men have held the opinions I stigmatize, I answer, some of the best of men have indeed held these theories, and of men who have held them I have loved and honored some heartily and humbly, but because of what they were, not because of what they thought. And they were what they were in virtue of their obedient faith, not of their opinion. They were not better men because of holding these theories. In virtue of knowing God by obeying his Son, they rose above the theories they had never looked in the face and so had never recognized as evil. Many have arrived in the natural progress of their sacred growth at the point where they must abandon them. The man of whom I knew the most good gave them up gladly. Good to worshipfulness may be the man that holds them, and I hate them the more, therefore. They are lies that, working under cover of the truth mingled with them, burrow as near the heart of the good man as they can go. Whoever, from whatever reason of blindness, may be the holder of a lie, the thing is a lie, and no falsehood must mingle with the justice we mete out to it. There is nothing for any lie but the pit of hell. Yet, until the man see the thing to be a lie, how shall he but hold it? Are there not mingled with it shadows of the best truth in the universe? So long as a man is able to love a lie, he is incapable of seeing it as a lie. He who is true, out and out, will know at once an untruth, and to that vision we must all come. I do not write for the sake of those who either make or heartily accept any lie. When they see the glory of God, they will see the eternal difference between the false and the true, and not till then. I write for those whom such teaching as theirs has folded in a cloud through which they cannot see the stars of heaven, so that some of them even doubt if there be any stars of heaven. For the holy ones who believed and taught these things in days gone by, all is well. Many of the holiest of them cast the lies from them long ere the present teachers of them were born. Many who would never have invented them for themselves, yet receiving them with the seals affixed of so many good men, took them in their humility as recognized truths instead of inventions of men, and oppressed by authority, the authority of men far inferior to themselves, did not dare dispute them, but proceeded to order their lives by what truths they found in their company, and so had their reward, the reward of obedience in being by that obedience brought to know god which knowledge broke for them the net of presumptuous self-styled orthodoxy every man who tries to obey the master is my brother whether he counts me such or not and i revere him but dare i give quarter to what i see to be a lie because my brother believes it the lie is not of god whoever may hold it well then many will say if you thus unceremoniously cast to the winds the doctrine of vicarious sacrifice, what theory do you propose to substitute in its stead? In the name of the truth, I answer, none. I will send out no theory of mine to rouse a fresh little whirlwinds of dialogistic dust mixed with dirt and straws and holy words hiding the master in talk about him. If I have any such, I will not cast it on the road as I walk, but present it on a fair patine to him to whom I may think it well to show it. Only eyes opened by the Son of Righteousness and made single by obedience can judge even the poor moony pearl of formulated thought. Say, if you will, that I fear to show my opinion. Is the man a coward who will not fling his child to the wolves? What faith in this kind I have, I will have to myself before God, till I see better reason for uttering it than I do now. Will you then take from me my faith and help me to no other? 
Your faith? God forbid. Your theory is not your faith nor anything like it. Your faith is your obedience. Your theory, I know not what. Yes, I will gladly leave you without any of what you call faith. Trust in God. Obey the word, every word of the Master. That is faith. And so believing, your opinion will grow out of your true life and be worthy of it. Peter says the Lord gives the Spirit to him that obey him. The Spirit of the Master, and that alone can guide you to any theory that it will be of any use to you to hold. A theory arrived at any other way is not worth the time spent on it. Jesus is the creating and saving Lord of our intellects as well as of our more precious hearts. Nothing that he does not think is worth thinking. No man can think as he thinks except he be pure like him. No man can be pure like him except he go with him and learn from him. To put off obeying him till we find a credible theory concerning him is to set aside the potion we know it our duty to drink for the study of the various schools of therapy. You know what Christ requires of you is right. Much of it, at least, you believe to be right and your duty to do. Whether he said it or not, do it. If you do not do what you know of the truth, I do not wonder that you seek it intellectually, for that kind of search may well be, as Milton represents it, a solace even to the fallen angels. But do not call anything that may be so gained the truth. How can you, not caring to be true, judge concerning him whose life was to do for very love the things you confess your duty, yet do them not? Obey the truth, I say, and let theory wait. Theory may spring from life, but never life from theory.